When and where were you born? I was born in 1938 in Catawba County, North Carolina. What's your name? Larry Eckerd. <laughs> um, what was your childhood like? Very good. We lived out in the country. We made our own games. We played baseball. We did all kinds of fun things in the evening. Mm -hmm. Did you have any siblings? I have two sisters. Um, how is growing up being different from now? Yes, because we didn't have cars back in those days. We rode bicycles wherever we went. And I'm speaking as kids. My parents had a car, of course. But if we kids went anywhere, we rode a bicycle or we walked. Mm -hmm. um, when you were little, did you know you wanted to serve our country? No, I didn't. Well, actually, I guess when I was about four years old, I got my first Army uniform. I, I saw it in a store in town, begged and pleaded till my mother bought it, and that was the first time I wore a uniform, and I still wear one to this day. <laughs> um, were you drafted or enlisted? I enlisted. Um, why did you join? That's hard to explain. Whenever I was 18, almost everyone was either enlisted or drafted. There was practically no young man that did not serve in the armed forces when I was growing up. So I felt like it was my duty, and I did. Mm -hmm. Where were you living at the time? The house that I grew up in, in Conover, North Carolina. Actually, out in the country, between Conover and Hickory. <laughs> Where did you um, like receive your basic training? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Um, like, was training to become a Green Beret was that different from? Oh, much different. <laughs> what was it like? Well, first there, there was no harassment. You didn't have to do push-ups for making a mistake. It was just hard. Field marches, learning to use demolitions, learning a certain amount of medical training. Um, ambushes, all kind of things that the ordinary citizen probably would never do. Um, do you feel you were prepared for what you faced in combat? Yes, I do. Um, how old were you when you went into war? The first time in combat I was 25. What wars did you actually serve in? Vietnam and in the Dominican Republic. Um, in Vietnam, where were you located? Well, I was there in the country four different times. So mm -hmm. I saw a good bit of the country. The longest was at a place called Bossue, down in the Mekong Delta, on a Special Forces A-Team. Mm -hmm. And an A-Team is where there are 12 Americans, 12 Vietnamese counterparts, and we had about 400, we call them strikers. They were Vietnamese or actually Cambodians that worked for us or fought with us. What was your biggest fear going into war? Being captured. I've I never worried too much about being killed, but I was scared to death of being captured. Did your parents like approve of you joining? No. I, m my daddy probably did, but my mother, she didn't care much for it. And to this, well, if she were alive today, she would tell you she don't understand why or what she did that would make me want to join the Army. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your first days in service? Yes. I was scared to death because I didn't know what to expect. And I'm sure everybody has heard of KP. That's kitchen police where they pick young privates to work in the kitchen to feed the other soldiers. And the first job I had was opening cans of peaches and apples and great big cans of fruit. And I stood there one whole shift doing my arm round and round with a, with a can opener, pouring peaches in a bowl, opening another can, pouring peaches in a bowl. And that, that was my first day. <laughs> what was your first combat experience like? Scary. But not to the point I was not able to function. Mm -hmm. the, the very first time I ever got shot at, 
was in the Dominican Republic, was eating a can of food on a, on a jeep. And this, this little thing, and the dirt flew up down at my feet. And it happened again. My, somebody should hit me! <laughs> and we took care of that. How did you cope with the fear? Most of the time I had been in, well, let me put it this way. By the time I got into combat, I had been in the Army long enough that I was a sergeant. And I had people that I was responsible for. I could not allow myself to show fear and lead troops at the same time. So you have to find a way to be the old man and not be afraid, mm -hmm. no matter how you feel. Were you married when you went into war? Yes. Did you have any kids? One. How was it like leaving them? Well, that was, that was hard to leave them, but that's what a soldier does. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you stay in touch with them while you were away? Well, in the Dominican Republic, we would write letters back and forth, and there was a ham radio operator that I occasionally got to talk to them. In Vietnam, we didn't have the ham radios, but we did have, we used tape recorders to send taped messages back and forth to each other, and of course we'd write letters back and forth. One interesting letter I got from my wife one time Apparently, I wrote in a hurry, and sometimes she couldn't read what I wrote very well. So she just sent me a letter with questions on in a check mark. Check yes or no. Are you all right? Yes or no. Well, are you still coming home on time? Yes or no. So I would just put check marks in these and send the letter back. What were your living conditions like? Everything from living, sleeping on the ground to actually having a building with running water and showers in it. Depending entirely on where you were. What was the food like? Not good. <laughs> Whenever we worked with the Vietnamese, we had something called, oh, what was the name of them? MREs, me Meals Ready to Eat, where they were geared toward the Vietnamese. And most of it was things like fish and rice, and seaweed and rice and things like that, that you really had to be hungry to eat. If you were in, in the what we call the garrison, back in a base camp, we had good food. We had an army mess hall that fixed food probably as good as we have today. Did you have plenty of supplies while you were there? Yes, we, we never lacked for anything. What was the weather like? Hot and rainy in Vietnam. And again, depending on what part of the country you were in, if you were up north, it got cold up there. We never saw any snow or anything like that, but it was just a cold rain down in the south. It was hot and muggy all the time. Mm -hmm. um, how did people entertain themselves? Playing cards, and I didn't like to play cards. Whenever you're in the field in combat, you, you don't entertain yourself. You try to stay alive. If you're back in garrison, there were clubs, non-commissioned officer, officer clubs, where they serve food and drink and, and occasionally Bob Hope or, or USO shows would come by where you would, would be able to see them. And they would even bring some of the entertainers out to where they had to have armed guards. It, it was close, close enough to the combat zone. Mm -hmm. Where did you travel while in service? I should say that. Where did you travel? We we lived in in North Carolina, Massachusetts, Arizona, California. Something seemed like there's somewhere else. Virginia. I lived in five states. I have been to every state in the United States and at least set foot in every all of the 50 states as whenever I was married I had my family with me in the Philippines in the Okinawa in Japan and Germany and they of course could not go with me to Vietnam or they didn't go into Cambodia or Laos while we were in Europe we traveled into France the Netherlands Belgium 
Austria, Italy, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, and I guess that's all. Mm -hmm. Do you have any photographs for more? No, I don't because someone stole my camera. That I used to have a little camera that I carried all the time, and I, it would hold hundreds of, of film. And someone stole it, and so I don't have anything left from Vietnam. I have some. I have some not war-related mm -hmm. pictures, but uh, none, none like that. What was your unit name? The one I'm most proud of is Fifth Special Forces Group, but I also served in the 82nd Airborne Division and in the Dominican Republic. How big was your unit? Primarily with 12 man A team in Special Forces in the 82nd, we had a company of about 200 people. Why was it so special? Because we were all volunteers. There were no no draftees in the in those days there were draftees in the army but you had to volunteer to go into special forces or serve in the in the airborne units how many casualties were in your unit when we went to vietnam we went over with 44 people and 39 came back was there any part of your job you were especially good at no i don't know think I would single out one thing that I was particularly good at. What part did you least enjoy? All of it. That I didn't I did not like getting shot at. But aside from that, there's nothing I really didn't like. Mm -hmm. What were your most memorable experiences? Staying alive. Did you have any friends in war? Yes. Did you ever meet any prisoners of war? No, non-Americans. I took prisoners, but I never met an American who was a POW. Did you meet, um, did you have any contacts with civilians? No, not, not much. If you mean during wartime, no. If you mean during peacetime in the United States, yes, we, we had neighbors just like you have and we have today. How long were you away? The longest I was ever gone at one time was a year. What was the scariest moment? There are two kinds of scared. There's a short-term scared when you're walking, like when you're walking down the hallway and someone jumps out and says, boo. That's short-term scared. Long-term is whenever you're dreading something. But a short-term has to be when we were going through a little Vietnamese village and like most kids in the whole world, kids come out to see the trucks, the vehicles, and would like for you to throw them candy or sea rations or something. And they did. We threw them our things. We got to the edge of the village. There was a, a little sharp curve. All of a sudden, the kids threw down all their candy, everything, put their hands over their ears, and ran away. And right then, you, you knew you were dead. You knew something was going to happen. Either you were going to run over a, an IED or you were about to be ambushed, but nothing happened. I, I, to this day, I don't know whether we missed whatever was in the road, whether the ambush thought we were too well armed to take on or why, but, no, but nothing happened. But it, just the sight of those kids throwing down things and running just literally made your heart stop. Um, did you have any injuries? No, I was never hurt. Um, do you remember the day the service ended? Yes, I retired, had a parade, all the good stuff. Um, what did you do right after you were um, discharged? I went to work for a mutual of Omaha insurance company in the management training program. Were you awarded any medals? Yes. Two bronze stars for heroism and ground combat. Do you have anything? Like, 
Do you have those medals here? Yes. Can we see them? Yes. <laughs> okay. If I can find them. Um, how did you feel about like the outcome of the war of Vietnam? Very disappointed. We didn't win. We didn't lose. We just left. And it was all politics. It was not the military. We could have won that war easily if the people in Washington had said, go win us this war, but they didn't. Um, was it life-changing? No. Okay. Um, what was it like coming back to normal everyday life? It was an adjustment. By the time I retired, I was an officer, and when I said do something, the troops did it. Well, that don't happen in civilian life. <laughs> you have to go into much more detail why it needs to be done, why it's a good idea. And that was a hard adjustment. Um, where, what was your favorite place you were stationed? Germany. I liked what we were doing there. It was fun. We got to travel over most of Europe. Uh, we got to go hiking in the Swiss Alps. We vacationed on the Italian Riviera. We climbed to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pizza. All kinds of neat things like that that we'd never ever been able to do otherwise. Um, did you go back to work after you did? Yes, after after I retired, I worked for Mutual Loan Law for a number of years. And then we started our own business that we still work at today. What's your own business? We plan and manage military reunions. And we work, I still work at the company, but in November or December of 2011, we sold it to our daughter, who is now the boss. Um... Do you regret anything you've ever done anymore? No, I'm, I'm not sorry I went. I, I feel like we we belonged there, and I didn't do anything that I would not not be proud of as part of the war. Um, were you were there a lot of women when you were in the war? Did you have any like how did you feel about the women being there and not? Well, when when I I went to Germany in, in the 70s. That's when there was an influx of women coming into the military. And they were the cream of the crop. They re they did a very good job. They were not not in a combat unit, but they, they were, to a, to a soldier, they were an asset to the Army and still are to this day. I don't approve of them being in a combat unit because there's no military reason they should be. But they have, women have done an excellent job and continue to do a good job. I was on the Special Forces A team in, in Vietnam. We, our camp was very close to the Cambodian border. And as I said earlier, there were 12 Americans. We had 12 Vietnamese counterparts and about 400 strikers and those strikers usually had their families with them so there were about 600 people total in our camp one of the young women there cleaned up the the house cleaned up our we had a building that we actually had a barracks like thing that we lived in but we she cleaned up did a little bit of cooking and just in general made herself useful we didn't have beds, so we sat in sleeping bags, so she didn't have to make up beds or anything like that. But she always wore this god-awful smelling perfume. And it, I mean, it stunk horribly. You could smell her coming. You didn't need to hear her. So we gave her the name of Smell Nice. She never, ever spoke to anybody in any language, so we knew that she didn't speak English. One night, we came under a, a rocket and mortar attack. Very, very heavy. And 
bunch of little people on the ground running toward us trying to kill us all. And right away we had two of the Americans were injured pretty badly. And we had a medic who was trying to treat them. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, smell nice appeared. And in perfect English, he said, let me help. I am the nurse. And from then on, she did. And as it turned out, and we didn't know any of this until much after, much, well, the next several days after that, she finally would have told us that she had gone to nursing school here in the United States. She deliberately dressed herself like a, a young, young girl because she had heard stories that American soldiers would molest or try, try to take advantage of young women. So she figured if she was young enough, nobody would mess with her. So that's why she's pretended to be such a young woman. After that, attack was over and it lasted for four days. We didn't have anything to eat, sleep, or anything for, for four days. After that was over, she had completely changed her mind and since her secret was out that she could speak English and had a nursing degree, then she stopped wearing the perfume. She kind of looked at us as big brothers and not, not somebody that she needed to be afraid of. And we continued to call her smell nice, though. <laughs> one night during one of the attacks, I was in a bunker with a machine gun, and I had a, my partner in the machine gun bunker was a fellow named Jim Alleygood. And I still see him at a reunion in Fort Bragg as recent as this past July. I saw him. But... We got hit with, with a recoilless rifle. I know you don't know what that is, but it doesn't matter. It, it's a shell about as big as from your wrist to your elbow. And it travels slow enough that you can see it, but fast enough you can't do anything about it. And it hit our bunker and knocked both of us out of the back, just tail end over tea kettle. And it, it takes a few seconds to kind of regain your wits about you to, and I looked around and I had all my arms and legs and I couldn't find anything that was broke or hurt, but my partner Jim Alligood was laying on his back, all sprawled out, he said, my back is messed up bad. So I, all my good medical training came back and I gently rolled him over, ready to administer to him and he had landed in an ant hill. There were literally hundreds of little ants crawling around and biting him. And I started to laugh. Even in a situation like that, some things are funny. And I started to laugh and, and knock ants off of him. He got so mad at me for laughing at him that I thought he was going to shoot me. And he, he, to this day, he won't let me touch his back. He said, my back is all right. Leave it alone. <laughs> Um, here it tells uh, Master Sergeant Alley Good and, and Staff Sergeant Eckard were in that bunker and that's me. <laughs> what was this book called again? That was called Boss Way, B-A-X-O-A-I. There's nothing within a hundred miles of here except us. So you can see our entertainment is very limited. <laughs> Special Forces policy was if you survived nine months in an, on an A-team like that, you could go back to one of the base camps, which was considered to be much safer for the last three months. But once you got back there, you learned that you were nothing more than a replacement. If someone got hurt, at one of the other camps, you just went out to replace them. So I was in that position, went to a place called Boone Black. Totally different than down in the Delta, where this place was, in the mountains. Foggy and rainy all the time. And during a one week period, we had absolutely nothing to eat. 
but tuna fish and cabbage and there's just only so many ways you can fix cabbage and tuna <laughs> and guess what I don't eat today <laughs> tuna I, I, I like cabbage that's fine but I didn't like tuna to begin with but you can fry it you can bake it you can eat it raw and it's still nasty <laughs> completely divorced from the infantry, nothing to do with, with the infantry, to make a com trip completely around the world. We were stationed in Virginia at the time, and we it was a secret base where what we did to this day is still classified. But we had listening posts throughout the world that listened to other people's communications and was given the opportunity to visit some of these places. So we went from Washington, D.C. to Paris, to Rome, to Tel Aviv, Israel, and then to Calcutta, India, to Bangkok, from Bangkok up into the high country, a place called Chiang Mai, then in a place called Udorn in Thailand, then we went to Hong Kong, then to Taiwan, then to Tokyo, and then to Honolulu, and then back home through San Francisco. And we, we conducted business in not all of the places, but some of them were just stopovers and we managed to miss a flight or two to stay there a little longer than maybe we should have. But, but it, it was an interesting trip. A very sensitive project when I retired that I have no idea how it ended. We What, what we did was go out to the Naples Weapons Center in China Lake, California, which sits on the edge of Death Valley. And every day we would go out into Death Valley to do what we needed to do and come back at night, go out the next day. And we, we had a particular objective that we were searching for, but just days before I retired, I had to leave. And nobody to this day will tell me how, how we did or how we didn't do. It was, there was four people between us and the president who knew what we were doing. And it, it, it was a whole lot more fun than work. And it, one of our team members flew back and forth to Washington. The, the senior person on the, on the team flew back and forth to Washington and brought back instructions. And I, one thing I will tell you that we had, we were stayed in a Motel 6 in a little place called Inukern, California. And it unless you get a map and hunt you won't ever find it but it's close it, it's there and the, the the night before I left we did what was called a debrief that they questioned everything that I was supposed to know and we we sat in this motel room with a bottle of Jack Daniels a six pack of coke and more classified material than God has ever seen assembled at one place. <laughs> and the next morning I came home. I went back to Fort Huachuca, Arizona, and then we came we came home. Who was the president at the time? Uh, at the time Jimmy Carter. And we had to stand down beside the road and wait for the first person we knew to come by and wave them down and take her to the doctor. But my mother had to deliver the baby. And she had in a past of other kids, and we all had to stay out in the yard. And it was time for our radio programs to come on in the evening, and she wouldn't let us in to hear the radio. In the Seven Mountains area in Vietnam. And we were given the job of clearing the drop zone so it would be safe and secure for the, for the jumpers to jump on. <clears throat> and at the appointed time, the headquarters element came up in helicopters, jumped out of the helicopters, and it was just as safe as walking into our backyard. 
And then the rest of the troops came and jumped. And we asked the command element to, since you jumped out of these helicopters, let it and get credit for a combat jump, let us go up and jump now too. And they wouldn't do it. And I've always had sort of a nasty taste in my mouth because they got credit for a combat jump and wouldn't let us do the same thing. And to a soldier, having a combat jump is a prestigious thing that uh, hardly no one ever does that. I mean, percentage-wise, it would be less than a half a percent, I'm sure, that would ever participate in a combat jump. And there, I think there were two or three in Vietnam the whole, whole number of years that we were there, so there, there just wasn't that many of them. 